you know, living and it's a beautifully, beautifully written. And, and I was just getting into um, her more famous book, Writing Down the Bones, which is a, a real um, milestone, you know, in culture. I mean, it's sold over a million copies. It's in 19 languages. And um, <clears throat> I think it's helped just untold numbers of people. But what I've, what I, what I've had, I'd come across this, you know, book, Wild Mind, knowing nothing about Natalie in a little bookstore in London. I was just sort of captivated by it and then found myself in Taos and um, kind of recklessly thought, well, I'll try to seek out this person and, and left a note for her <laughs> in the local bookstore. So if you asked if they knew, I'd say, of course we do. You know, well, does she ever come in? Well, from time to time. So I left a note and it kind of never thought I'd really was likely to sort of hear anything back. But actually, Natalie called me maybe a week later, very kindly. And um, what did she or did she leave a note for me or something? I can't remember. But anyway, we met and uh, she was tremendously kind and helpful um, on a practical level and, and on a sort of mentoring kind of level. But much more than that, you know, she she did for me what I imagine she's done for many of us, which was sort of, you know, connect writing and practice to make allow writing to be a gateway to practice a way of practicing a way of discovering our own hearts and minds in a much deeper way and conversely allowing writing to be a gateway to the dharma you know so that they each of course in the end i suppose are just one anyway but really i mean for me personally on that Dharma side, you know, I'd been um, meditating a few years by then, but to taste in her, in her presence, and then on the page, and then through just the sort of guidance of the way she lived and did things, this beautiful, radiant simplicity that she embodied and was really living, and somehow I sort of had the savvy to just sense that Zen training had something to do with that, you know, and, and turn to this incredibly simple, radical simplicity of Zen as a, as a way of living and as a way of uh, growing that's like nothing else, just so simple, but so deep. And she really opened that up for me and I think for many of us and it's 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 an extraordinary thing for me personally to think that you know I'm now in this um role of responsibility and for a zen center you know it's, it's, it would simply would have been inconceivable uh, if if I hadn't met Natalie and um Natalie what have you got me into you know <laughs> um but you know much much gratitude I, I could go on and on, and but you know, thank you for being here. How does this work? Oh, okay, here I am. Unmute myself. Can you all see me and hear me? Um, yes, Henry, this is so wonderful for you to introduce me, and um, I worry about you when you said, "What did I get you into?" I worry about it because I understand I've taught for many years and um, one can be eaten alive. And, uh, but for me, what has protected me is I always had writing. So um, I, I th I'm glad you're taking off this time. And I was thinking about it when I met Henry, I had just come from, 12 years of sitting with Katagiri Roshi. So it was just exuding. And I never understood that when I wrote Writing Down the Bones that people thought it was about anything but Zen. And so I met Henry, I was deep into Zen, but he was a writer. And when I went to the bookstore in Taos, the only reason I called him was there was a note and he said, an author from England. And I thought if he called himself an author, he must be a serious writer. So I might be safe calling him. 
And um, so I was in the Zen position more and he was the author. And I thought about it tonight, he's the Zen teacher at this wonderful place, Mountain Cloud, and I'm presenting a, a book. But I don't want us to forget, I hope that everybody has read Henry's book, One Blade of Grass. It came out about two years ago, I think. And I was so happy. He did what I wanted somebody to do. I had written Long Quiet Highway in 92 and wrote about how this Jewish girl from Brooklyn got into Japanese Zen. And how do we get in back into these things? And One Blade of Grass is the next um, entrance with Henry, how he got into it. So I've been waiting for someone to write it and it's wonderful and he's a wonderful writer. So now I have three simple lines, which is really my 15th book. And a student of mine two nights ago, Sonia, who lives in Mexico said, how do you keep writing books? And I thought that was a really great question. I realized it was so obvious to me on one level that I never said it, I never articulated it. But um, I went to Katagiri Roshi because he walked his talk. And that's what I thought Zen was about. You don't just talk about it, you live it, you embody it, it's your life. So I felt maybe naively that if I was going to teach writing, as a practice, and really as a Zen practice, I had to walk my talk and I had to keep writing books so I could show you and that I wouldn't get stuck and that I would continue to understand what it is to write a book and continue really to be broken because to write a book breaks you and to continue to be broken so that I would be open to my students and whatever they brought up in writing, I could be right there with them. So I felt that I couldn't talk about writing with actually without doing it. And so this is my 15th book and um, it's about a writer's pilgrimage into the heart and homeland of haiku. And if you do read at the beginning, it's called the uh, teaser page. The first page are a lot of long quotes and Henry has the longest and he wrote the most beautiful. He felt like he was about to continue and keep going into a book. It was so beautiful. So I thank you, Henry. And I really thank you for introducing me tonight and coming out of your retreat. I really appreciate that. And I guess I love you forever. I, you know, we're bonded. So um, I had a tremendous shock. I, I went deep into haiku. I wanted to share it. I also want to share it because haiku people, like we have the way of Zen, haiku people back in Japan lived the way of haiku. Many of us have read Basho um, who really, brought forth haiku in Japan in the 17th century. And he wrote a book called um, Journey to the Deep North, where he put a backpack on his back and for six months walked and wrote, wrote prose and then haiku. And it really charged my imagination when I read it, living as a hippie in Taos, New Mexico, reading it on my thin mattress on the floor. And I imagined him going out into the deep, when it says the deep north, the uncivilized, the wild and the cold. And um, he always went, you, not always, but mostly went with someone. And I'm not sure those people weren't his lovers because it's kept quiet, but I did undig the fact that he was pretty much a homosexual. And, um, so it was probably a lover. And he would go to wander, like we would want to wander to Kansas City 
or someplace that we haven't been that's in America and write haiku and see it. He was very curious. And um, I read that book and I never forgot it. And it was really his way in the world was to wander and to write haiku. And I wanna read you this little bit about what it means to have a way of haiku. What is the way of haiku? Bare attention, no distractions, pure awareness, noticing only what is in the moment, being connected to seasons, unconnected to self-clinging. And then out of that, composing your experience in three lines that go beyond logic, that make the mind leap. In the center, a taste of emptiness, a frog, a crow, a turnip. The ordinary right in front of you is the realm of awakening. Pure Zen, but not Zen. They make it very clear when you study the haiku writers that they're haiku writers. Many of them, certainly um, Isa, Basho, and Busan went to monasteries and practiced sometimes for five years, but they left to follow the way of haiku. And many of them at the end of their life were busy right to the face of death. They wrote a final haiku before they died. And what got me on the deep path, many of us learned in the US in grammar school, five, seven, five, and we would practice haiku. And, but that isn't real haiku. Um, I, I studied with Allen Ginsberg in 1976 at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa Institute. And I'll read you a little what Alan said. And this is much more the way of real haiku. Alan Ginsberg, the poet, first introduced me to haiku. There are four great Japanese haiku writers, he declared, holding up a finger for each one as he named them in front of the class in the summer of 1976. Basho, Busan, Isa, Shiki. No women, I thought. Okay, I'd take the boys on and learn what I could from them. Sure, there were some women hidden in history. He also told us that the formal five syllables, then seven, then five, often taught in Western schools, does not necessarily work in English. In Japanese, each syllable counts. They don't have the, an, that, those articles of speech. So he encouraged us not to worry about the count if we write or translate haiku. Only make sure the three lines make the mind leap. The only real measure of haiku, Alan told us that one hot July afternoon is upon hearing one, your mind experiences a small sensation of space. He paused, I leaned in breathless, which is nothing less than God. And so that has always been my test of a haiku. And uh, many of us were turned off to haiku because you pick up a haiku book and the translations, if you don't have a good translation, forget it. You have to have a good translation because otherwise it's dead. It's really dead. So um, I went back to Japan and as I do with writers and painters, I wanted to meet these haiku writers, the four greats, and I did find a great woman haiku writer, Chioni. And I found out she had many disciples and um, just like the boys, because I should say, just like a Zen teacher, 
the haiku teachers, the haiku masters had disciples. And at their deathbed, they were all there. And I tell a story in here of going and finding Busan's grave. Right after Katagiri died, I read a haiku by Busan. I'll tell it to you. Let me see. Oh, okay, I got it. And I read it. I was up at um, Ojo Caliente. And I read this in the early 90s. And it knocked me out. And it opened me to Busan. And I made a vow that eventually I would go to Japan and visit his grave and thank him. It took me 19 years, but I did it. That's what Zen people are like. You just stay in there beyond stupidity. <laughs> okay, so this is the haiku that made me search for Busan. And this was right after Katagiri had died. Ah, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. I'll tell it to you again. See if you experience that little sensation of space. Ah, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. That's how closely you have to notice things to be a haiku writer and really to be a Zen person, to be a practitioner, to slow down enough so the world becomes luminous. Haiku are all over, all around. And I realize I'm telling you, but it's in here, the whole story. There's many stories in here. I'll read you something else. I don't know what Henry read you. After he read the book, I found out he came into Mountain Cloud and read um, from this book. And I said, Henry, why didn't you wait until the book is out so they could go buy it? He said, yeah, I should have thought of that. He said, I should have asked you if I could read it, but I was afraid you say no. So I wanted to read it. So, but I'll hope you'll buy it because we need support. And the publisher now, when your book first comes out, looks to see if it's selling. So um, I want to read you some more. Uh, okay. The Way of Haiku. The summer for before I leave for Japan, I write this haiku. This black pen feels meaty in a writer's hand. Please don't imagine that my decades of writing practice and Zen meditation have silenced or fully pacified the angry self-critics in my head. That's not how it works. I'm just much better at managing those voices. After I write that haiku, my inner critic rises up and skewers me. What does a black pen have to do with this beautiful July day? Meaty, give me a break. You think you're a writer? Since when? Next, it goes for the jugular, unadorned and raw. It leaps. I hate you. You're stupid. I'm at Viacito Mountain Retreat Center, a place I love. The sky is big. Dragonflies flutter over the clear pool. I see the head of a beaver jutting out of the water on the far side. My legs are burning in the intense sun. In that exquisite moment, I let the critical voices pass. It's okay, I tell myself, try another. I do. On my brown socks, a single black butterfly flaps its wings. Don't know where I'm going, but okay, another. A fire burns across the valley. I want to go home. And another, diving into this cold, ice cold pond, my 70th summer. I stand up on the deck, 
yank off my shirt and shorts and do what I just rode, enter the dark, frigid mountain lake fed by melting snow. I swim back and forth, gasping, panting, until I think, Nat, if you don't stop now, you're going to die. I pull myself out, every pore alive. I think, but haiku are not so dramatic. They're ordinary, subtle. I'm a bear grasping after a flower petal. I look around, towel wrapped across my belly, hair dripping. I can't take a step without stepping on a haiku. All around me, they're waiting. Full moon behind clouds, your lips on mine. And with that one, I think I thought maybe I had written a haiku. I want you to hear some of the great ones. I'll read from the first page, which the title is Nothing Less Than God. Haiku is a refuge when the world seems chaotic, when you're lost, frightened, tangled, and nothing is clear. Unaware, the place is famous, a man tilling a field. Shiki. I read this and cock my head, listening deeper than my pain and confusion. A prominent place, a man doing what's in front of him. I read another, peeling a pear, a trickle of sweet juice along the blade. Shiki again, I smile. I've seen that on the knife many times and now Shiki has made me conscious of it. Something sexy about it too. Peeling a pear, a trickle of sweet juice along the blade. A flea bite also, when she is young, is beautiful. Isa. Is it the actual bite, round and pink, that is beautiful? or the young girl who got it? Or is there no difference? An insect bite is elemental. My busy thoughts are settling. My curiosity is piqued. The complicated world is made of simple elements. The evening cool, knowing the bell is tolling our life away. Isa. That bell that strikes at twilight marks another day passing. All these years I heard the big hollow sound in the zendo or in a distant church and an unnameable emotion rose in me, but I never articulated what it was. Of course, impermanence. Maybe I didn't want to know. One full turn of the sun after another. Nothing to grab onto. I move deeper into the truth of my life. Dear, dear, what a fat, happy face it has. This peony, Isa. The first time I saw peony was with Jim White, a fine poet. We were walking down Emerson Avenue in Minneapolis in the springtime, and there they were, big, almost rotund, the buds enormous. You know how they open, Jim said, bending down with his big body. They secrete a sweet sap that attracts the ants. The ants crawl in and open the petals. He bent closer and touched one, named it Peony. A whole universe of the Midwest opened. Later, I found peonies, petunias, and zinnias in other places. But for me, they originated in the heart of the country. Now haiku has woken up memory, led me to grief. Jim died too young of an enlarged heart. The piercing cold, 
in our bedroom, stepping on my dead wife's comb, Busan. I am sailing far beyond the original ang agony that drove me to haiku an hour ago. That's okay. Any emotion one feels, pure and simple, moves, passes, if accepted. Earlier, I was trying to dominate my confusion, make it clear. Haiku reminds me that it clears on its own with patience over time. And let me tell you, with what's going on now in our country, when you get really desperate and even you're sitting zazen and cannot settle, grab a good book of haiku. It has really helped me. Um, I think I'll read this. If you write five haiku in a lifetime, you are a haiku writer. If you write 10, you are a master, Basho said. He didn't mean don't practice, don't try, but he was saying the stakes were high. In writing a real one, the world drops away, mind and body shatter, and the only thing left is the crow coin. You've dropped the old yellow coat of yourself, your sorrow, desire, indifference. The world has stepped forward and you have stepped back, another way of coming home. To put this experience down in three lines is to transmit a taste of what is possible and pass it on. Great generosity. You penetrate down through the generations. How I long to see among the morning flowers, the face of God, Basho. Though Basho and Busan studied in monasteries, they never became monks. They took their lives outside the cloistered walls into the immense world of nature. Both brought their understanding into poems that were passed down. But the haiku poems were not always immediately understandable. I contemplated Basho's most famous one for a long time. Frog jumps in old pond, water sound. I've seen different translations. For instance, old pond, frog jumps in, plop or ancient pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. I've also seen this haiku made fun of, maybe because it's simple, yet painfully elusive. You know there is something there, but what? Sort of like a koan, but what? I feel the frustration. Old poet jumps in, frog jumps out. But nonetheless, Basho's haiku is serious and carries some quintessential cultural and aesthetic significance. Everyone in Japan knows it. Was it morning as I was munching toast outside or turning a corner in the car or glancing at my watch about to go to an appointment? Yes, that was it reaching for the knob, the door casing, the single window in the green painted wood, I stepped over the threshold. His mind was empty. That's all there was, sitting or standing by the water, the flash movement of the frog, then the sound, the sound, the sound, filling his ears, his mind and heart, nothing else in the whole world. The realization poured through me like a waterfall rushing to the bottom. It might have been a dentist appointment, piles of people magazines, two stray New Yorkers, a white paper cup of half drunk tea on the table, the round impression of another one on the glass surface, hum of a drill in a room beyond the waiting room, 
I was no longer waiting. I had arrived in the middle of a famous haiku, no longer left out, outside, wanting in, no in or out, no nothing, something, the old pond of the mind, finally quiet. Here's another translation. At the ancient pond, a frog plunges into the sound of water. Here, Basho is that frog. So I hope I helped. It took me, it was sort of like a hike, a, a koan for me. I couldn't, it was so obvious, but I couldn't get it. And then one day in a dentist's office, it appeared for me. I hope this helps. It doesn't make it more crazy. I mean, I worked on this minimum a year and then suddenly it's so right there in front of your face. Um, I guess we have a little time, okay. I'm just gonna read you a little from Santa Fe because people love to hear about where they live. I plan to leave for Japan on October 29th, but when the time comes, I don't wanna leave home. In all my decades in New Mexico, I've never seen a more gorgeous fall. The aspens and cottonwoods along Alameda, following the thin Santa Fe River and down a Seque Madre are pure gold. New Mexico does not get the red and orange of Eastern autumns, only a rich dash of crimson from the ivy crawling up and entwining tree limbs and trunks. But this yellow is enough. We even have some hard rains in this dry country, the air sweet. The leaves do not fall, but continue to glimmer week after week, stretching out every inch of this season. I hadn't had a regular old cafe for doing writing practice in for a long time. Mostly I write in the small studio attached to my house and surrender to solitude. But I recently discovered Capital Coffee on the corner of Old Santa Fe Trail and Paseo next to Connie's, the local grocer, and I am in heaven with the comfortable wooden chairs like they had in public schools long ago. Square tables, big windows, across from the state capitol, a blue US mailbox on the corner where mail is picked up once a day at 110. Even the stretch of parking lot outside seems beautiful, God's country. I'm writing in my glory. Here I am again with people chatting around me and Dylan blasting over the loudspeakers. I don't want to leave the cafe and that towering cottonwood at the top curve of the hill, each leaf a glittering gilt heart. Right before I leave for the airport, I run out of my house a last time to look. But there I go, off to find Busan and Basho and everybody. And as I was reading that, I thought of a haiku that I love very much by Shiki. And um, a lot, and you have to understand, there's not a lot of books translated about these people's lives. So I read whatever I could find. And Shiki, who, um, because of Shiki, we have haiku now in the 21st century. He died in 1902 and he made, haiku into literature and passed it on. And um, it always would get really big. Then for instance, Basho would die and it would go back again into being a court uh, flirtation haiku or funny. And then Busan would come along and make it serious again. Then he'd die and then Isa and then Shiki. But Shiki had TB. Oh, I write a whole chapter 
All that I'm telling you is in this book, but I'm so excited about it. I'm thinking, Henry, maybe sometime when COVID is done, I don't want to do it on Zoom, I'll come and teach a haiku class at Mountain Cloud. We'll have a lot of fun. But um, Shiki died in his thir early 30s. And he coughed his first blood when he was 13. So his whole life, he knew he was going to die early. And the last five years of his life, like at 29, he was in bed. He was so sick, he was in bed. And yet he not only kept writing haiku, he became very literary and he had many, many disciples. He started magazines. He was completely dedicated. And on his deathbed, he wrote three haiku. He just was spurting it out and waiting. He knew he was going to die very young. And the last five years of his life, darn, I have it on my desk. I have a photo of Shiki. The last five years of his life, he was uh, bed bound. And he would get up each morning and crawl in a lot of pain to the edge of the tatami mat, open the, push open the window and sit there all day, looking out at the garden, waiting for a haiku. And as I was reading the last part about Capital Coffee, I remembered this haiku that he wrote. I should find the whole thing. I love it very much. And you have to remember, it's particularly poignant because he was going to die. And he knew that. You go, I stay, two autumns. Talk about the taste of impermanence. Zen talks about impermanence. It's one of the mark, the three marks of existence. But in all my years, I couldn't taste it like I tasted it in that haiku. You go, I stay, two autumns. But oddly enough, in the wonderful translation, there's a book by Robert Haas of the great haiku writers. You might want to get it. But in it, he gives credit to Busan for that haiku. But you know it's shiki. It sounds like shiki. When Kaz Tanahashi was visiting Upaya Zen Center, I asked him, because he's Japanese, I said, whose is it? Busans or shikis? It's that, and he looked and he said, it does sound like shiki, but it may be Busans. He said, don't do any research. See if we can just hang out in the mystery. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> so I'm hanging out with Busan and shiki. I think they would like it too. So I think what I want to do is read you some more haiku, a few more haiku, and then maybe open it to um, question and answer, because you might want to ask me something, or you might want to say something. Here's another, in the chapter of Shiki, here's another one that drove me crazy, like the frog. I... I have to slow up, really slow up. I'm not going to explain it. I think I write about it here. But if you have to know, first of all, what a coxcomb is. It's a certain kind of odd flower. And this is a, Shiki wrote this. And I found out, you know, he couldn't go in the garden. He was just look at it. And a neighbor one day planted a grown coxcomb. So the next day when he crawled out, there was a coxcomb magically in full maturity in his garden. So he wrote this haiku and I contemplated it for a long time, like a koan. Coxcomb must be 14 or 15. He didn't even show any surety. But even in his suffering, 
he's able to ponder the coxcomb. How many? 14 or 15? He accepts ambiguity, a high mark for haiku. He accepts the mind of uncertainty and expresses it, making this haiku modern, conversational, banal, unassuming, mortal, almost like a whisper. So you want me to read you some other haiku by Shiki? And just listen. Ocean and mountains, way beyond 17 syllables. Are you feeling the pleasure? Just the pleasure. Cherries blooming, people I remember all far away. Cherries blooming, people I remember all far away. Oh, I love this one. Stifling heat, tangled in confusion, I listen to thunder. He's giving you right here instructions for how to help yourself, especially now. It is so hard in this country and all over the world now. Stifling heat, tangled in confusion, I listen to thunder. Nearing death, even louder, autumn cicadas. Nearing death, even louder, autumn cicadas. Oh, this one. Ready? I wish you were all here. <laughs> Winter camellia, using all its strength, blooming red. Winter camellia, using all its strength, blooming red. You can feel how he is talking about himself in this last haiku, his huge effort to live and assert his vision through the camellia that pushes to bloom, even in cold, inclement weather. Um, Busan, who really felt that Basho was his master and came after Basho, he and his disciples rebuilt Basho's hut. And they made a vow that every year they would meet for a weekend and drink, drink sake and write haiku all weekend. Isn't that beautiful? So, um, Basha, a shiki who couldn't, didn't have the energy to do anything immense like that, but he loved persimmons, just loved persimmons. Anniversary of Basho, alone, I eat a persimmon. And persimmons are ripe in the fall, and Basho died in the fall. I'll give you a little flavor of Busan. And really it's because here's Shiki, Basho is the biggest thing in Japan. No one dares say anything against him, but Shiki wrote a whole critique about Basho and um, <clears throat> said, if I don't do that, um, Haiku will die because you'll keep trying to imitate Basho rather than find your own images and become modern. So he crashed, broke the image of Basho. And by doing that, he's the one that discovered a hundred years after Busan was dead, he was discovered. Busan was a great painter. So he was known as a painter. And it was Shiki that discovered Busan as a haiku writer. This is all in the book. 
but I can't shut up because I, there's so much to tell you. So um, I owe a great deal to Shiki because Shiki found Busan and I found the haiku, ah, grief and sadness. So I'll read you a little of Busan's haiku. The two plum trees, I love their blooming, one early, one later. The rainy season and the river with no name, a frightening thing. The rainy season and the river with no name, a frightening thing. The high priest relieved his noble bowels in a desolate field. See, I didn't put, oh, there's so much here. But I think one of the things I wanna tell you and then I'll open it up if there's time. I finished the book and it was not easy. I couldn't admit to myself for three years, I didn't know what I was doing. I just kept studying and kept you know, reading about people. I even joined a haiku group in Santa Fe and went every month. And, um, and then when I was finally done with the book where I realized I was gonna braid everything together, I, two months later, I had an idea for the epilogue but the epilogue had nothing to do with the book. But I decided to write it anyway and see if it fit. And it did fit. And only then did I realize, I mentioned Allen Ginsberg at the very beginning. And then the epilogue was about him. And I realized the whole book was an homage to Allen Ginsberg. We had become friends after I'd studied with him many years later when Bones came out. And really he is the one that put together for me writing and the study of mind, that they're completely integrated. And so I didn't realize all those years of my struggle, I was writing an homage to Allen Ginsberg and what he said in that class in 1976. So um, if anybody wants, you can, I don't know how this works, but somebody maybe that's in control can call on someone to ask a question if you want, if that's a possibility. Yeah, Natalie, um, let me just jump in for a second. And Christian, okay. could maybe what we could do is have people raise hands there's that in, in the in the list, you know, there's a raise hand option if you go to, I think you go to reactions, is that right? Okay. I, I, I don't know how any of this works. So Yeah, and then Christian, if you wouldn't mind looking out for that and then sort of call on people. But I've got to say one thing myself, just right off the okay. bat. Um, what an amazing talk, Natalie. I mean, you could just feel how the sort of energy that you're just carrying and sharing and about it is just fantastic. You know, we don't, think about it we just experience it it's very very you communicate it immediately i think i imagine everybody's been feeling that very very beautiful talk i mean but i've got to say that i didn't say at the start this is an amazing book um the basically the 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 thing that i felt so much and i wrote about mm -hmm. it in that paragraph that could have gone on and on is that it's a dream book because it's it's this dream meeting of subject and author it is like i mean i've read i think every book natalie's written actually over all these years and i love all of them but there's something i mean this there's something very remarkable in this one of just it's so deep it's like limitlessly deep because it's exactly the right subject and it's exactly the right author and this to to find deep understanding of haiku in in english language people is not very common at all and i don't know that anybody brings haiku to life certainly they haven't for me the way this book does and it's a beautiful narrative. It's not just sort of a book about haiku. It's a, the whole book is a deep journey, 
which carries you along. It's the most remarkable piece of work. It's really a very unusual, unusually deep and fine, remarkable book. And I, I mean, really, I'm, I'm plugging it. And I really hope if you haven't already, you will buy one and buy more than one, share them out. You know, it's, it's a truly, it's a very, very beautiful journey that it takes you on when you read this book. So don't think of it as just a book about haiku, not at all. I mean, yes, you'll understand haiku in a way you never have before. You'll, res you'll resonate with them and they feel them very deeply in your life. But it's a very entrancing experience. It's a deep, deep thing. Practitioner or not, it doesn't matter. Hey, um, so can we, uh, I hope this isn't too much, too, I hope it's not too much work for you, Christian. Is it okay to do this raising the hand thing? Or, or actually, yes, also absolutely. There's, there's two people who have uh, who have raised their hands. Okay, somebody said the raised hand thing is in participants. So, what if you? So, if you go to your name and then you can raise your hand, is that right, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. You should if you open up participants, um, and you should see a blue button that will will. Um, Oh, it looks like you need to go maybe to to more if you don't see it, and it should allow you to raise your hand. You, you could also go into chat and say, you know, write a question in chat or just say in chat, hey, I want to ask a question. Right? Would that work too? That that works too, yeah. Shall, shall we begin with Maria Habito? Can you? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's Maria uh, beside me and Ruben Amito here. Natalie, thank you so much. We hi, hi. Nice to so see much. you. Nice, nice to see you. What you offered today was so heart filling and so uh, sparkling. Hi. I have uh, been uh, in haikus through the years and I uh, have just touched the surface, but what you offered tonight invites me to go much deeper from here on and uh, that uh, has opened a new path for me now i have so many other things to say but i have a question well okay. two points that really rose up for me was that a haiku is not just uh, forming five uh, five seven uh, five uh, set of lines and ju just presented even though they, they may they may or may not rhyme but it has to have that capacity to make your mind leap and yeah, that's, that's the true test. But yeah. what I say in there is that um, in Japanese, yes. uh, they don't have the, uh, and. So each syllable really counts for a lot. So in English, if you want to write them, just write three short lines. But then you think, well, what's the difference between that and a short poem? Well, the difference is there's, there's that leap. Yes, that right, exactly. And that leap is precisely something very similar to a Zen experience of seeing something totally in, in a totally different light. And that's a kind of mind leap. There are many Zen practices. Right. And when Henry said this book is like a dream, sometimes for me, koans, when yeah. I really answer one, it's like understanding a dream that falls through my body. Exactly. And yeah. you awaken in that dream and see. And now the other point is uh, related to that, that haiku from Basho that you quoted, that in a flower, you see the face of God. Uh -huh. and like that. Now, my question is, if we really, if we read the haikus and if we taste them, they're uh, about nature, about trees, birds, uh, frogs, and ponds, and so on. Now, we live in an age where there are uh, things like highways, cement, airports, and so on. You can throw anything in. That's and right. Really, it's about you. Yes, good. Thank you. That's what I wanted Thank to confirm. You. That if you're in an airport or if you're in a mall and something happens, yes. that also. I, I, I studied the old ancients. I wanted to understand the root of it. But yeah. you can't believe all over the country people are writing haiku and their haiku conferences. It's and modern haiku, I wish I had some here, are knockout. But I was interested in the way of haiku, mm -hmm. living it with your whole life, like we do Zen, if we're, you know, lucky enough. Thank you. And, that's 
confirms my, my what I wanted to ask. And Maybe I some... can also say a word, Natalie. Thank you. This was so beautiful. And you talk brought up a memory of us. For We lived in Japan with our children from 1998 to 2000. And the younger one went to kindergarten. And what yeah. you about the haiku staying with you all your life, they taught the children haikus. And so this little boy who learned a new language came home glowing with his haiku. And we knew the haikus in Japanese because we studied them. And it was such an aha moment to see yeah. this little child speaking that language and that haiku. And the understanding is that the children will carry that with them all their lives because they learn it so young. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's also one of the ways in Asia in which you embody something that you learn when you're very young and it stays with you all your life. You know, what's interesting, um, I, I tell the whole story in here that Harada Roshi came looking for me. It's a different Harada, I think, than you know. But he was Katagiri Roshi's best friend and he read Writing Down the Bones in Japanese translation. So he came looking for me and I wrote, wrote a lot about it in here. Well, he was very excited about the book. I sent it to him, FedExed it overnight. Because, and he wrote back, we, I have a friend who translates for me. She wrote back and I talk about her in here, Mitsue. She wrote back what he said. He knew everything that was in the book. And we said, how she wrote him and said, how do you know that? Because he doesn't speak English. And listen to what he said. He said, I read what I cannot read. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, they are so excited in Japan. He said, send me quick eight copies. I have to give them to everyone. I realized they're excited because they know what haiku is. Mm -hmm. And my first interview with 